welcome everyone. We are going to start this program, which is really actually about George Washington's home, but it's going to be a lot about George Washington himself because he was the most famous person to ever occupy it. I have to do give some credit to the Mount Vernon Ladies Association. Their website is an excellent way to research pretty much anything you would ever want to know about the estate, about its past, its present, restorations, everything they've been doing. Uh, Wikipedia has been helpful and also a, a history channel website. And I couldn't have done this without recognizing them. But uh, anyway, let us start. Uh, now, of course, the land was occupied by a tribe called the Dogs, uh, and uh, they were Native American people who lived in Virginia. They were believed to be a branch of another tribe in Maryland called the Nanticoke, and uh, they were based in the eastern shore of Maryland, but it's not really that difficult to get from one to the other, and so they were there for hundreds of years. But later on, um, it passed into the Washington family and George's grandfather, John, who was the first Washington to come to America, he actually um, gave it to a daughter who sold it uh, to her brother. And now it's Augustine Washington, George's father, and he, in turn, later on, uh, willed it to his uh, eldest son, Lawrence, who was George's half-brother. And when uh, Lawrence, both Washingtons actually lived there, George was three years old when his family moved there and built the original house. And then uh, Lawrence and his family occupied it for nine years. And after Lawrence's death, which we believe is from tuberculosis, it would pass to his wife, Anne, who had a life interest in the property. And that was sort of interesting because the life interest meant she had a certain share of the profits of the estate. And in the meantime, uh, George uh, rented Mount Vernon from her. And upon her death, he actually was able to get it outright. And uh, so basically it was a 2000 acre property. Now this is who the estate was named for. Admiral Edward Vernon was uh, a commander in a very obscure uh, European war called the War of Jenkins' Ear. And Lawrence had served under him and, and admired him so much that the original Little Hunting Creek Plantation name was changed to its present name. And another thing uh, Vernon was distinguished for, he introduced a staple of the British Navy right up until the 20th century, watered down rum called grog. And now, you know, acquiring Mount Vernon, uh, the Washingtons were considered sort of mid-level gentry, respectable, but not really on the top ranks of Virginia society. And uh, so when he got that acreage, it really just basically raised his social standing to a great degree. One of the things they have at Mount Vernon are uh, a book of manners that young George purchased in order to polish himself to be with his new peers, as it were. Uh, although one of the things I've read about that book is that it's a little curious, some of the instructions. My favorite one was that I guess could not clean his teeth with the tablecloth at a dinner. So I'm a little dubious about some of the advice, but that's what happened. That's what happened. Now this is really interesting because uh, this is the house that 
which was built by uh, George's grandfather, and he lived in, uh, Lawrence lived in it, and that's what he, he eventually acquired. And this is a map of all the improvements. So starting from 1757, you can gradually see all these changes to expand race uh, the house to a, se a second then later an attic story and expanding wings and finally this is the final appearance by 1787 and now the outbuildings were it was a custom for Virginia plantations to actually have the kitchens outside of the main house because one it was the root there saved the house in case of fire because it was open fire hearth cooking and another one it kept the house cooler and that was an important consideration and washington had an interesting touch these colonnades were actually uh, built to allow uh, the the his his slave labor waiters to bring food into the house without getting it rained on or uh, snowed upon. And that was a rather neat trick. Although I think it sort of reduced the uh, protection for the house should a fire have occurred, but it apparently never did. Now, one of the things I liked was to dress up the exterior. He actually had the wood planks room to resemble cut stone. So that's what it looks like. If you, if you don't really, if you don't look close, it really does look like it's built of stone as was popular in Europe. Now, of course, George's social position was cemented by marrying a widow, Martha Dandridge Custis, and uh, Martha was the richest woman in colonial Virginia. And uh, in fact, I've even read sources that George was considered to be something of a dark horse in the Maris sweep states because every eligible uh, man in Virginia wanted to marry her because of her late husband's vast holdings and estates. In fact, Arlington House, where Arlington Cemetery is, was a Custis estate. And so he moved Martha and her two children to, uh, that began the expansion of Mount Vernon. And while he was doing that, he was also taking care of the outside. And it was his custom to ride uh, the acres every day see what was going on, and he would keep a, a diary, a farm journal, basically, of what he saw, what was growing, what wasn't, you know, anything that affected the crops. Now, of course, one of his biggest problems was that he, he starting in 1775, he were, had offered himself to lead uh, the newly formed American army in our resistance to gain freedom from Great Britain. And so he was gone, largely gone. I think he only got back to Mount Vernon once, and that was almost really basically uh, after Yorktown. So he was away for eight long years, and uh, his wife Martha and cousin Lund Washington managed and Lund was an employee. He wasn't a family member helping out. He actually was paid by Washington. Washington at some point even apologized being arrears in paying Lund because of the war and you know our our money, the continental. I just still hear this expression that something not doing well is not worth a, a continental because we didn't have enough goods, services, and credit to back up the money. It virtually was valueless. And uh, so anyway, uh, but Martha and Lund ran the plantation. 
they, uh, Martha, every winter joined George at every winter encampment, and she would actually load two carriages full of things like medical supplies. And I mean, now we're used to having important people like Martha being conducted around in, I mean, huge parades of black bulletproof limousines everywhere and SUVs, but all Martha had beside the two carriages was uh, a 12-man guard. And I mean, that was, that was, that was all uh, she had in order to travel hundreds of miles to wherever George was in camp, which was mostly in New Jersey and Pennsylvania. And, you know, even with the war, George managed to keep careful tabs on the estate and there are existing letters that he kept with uh, Lund about, you know, doing this, doing that. And, uh, and this is where he did it from. This, the, this was the last surviving example of George Washington's uh, battle tent. The, these were his quarters while he was in the field during the actual fighting period. In the wintertime around October, everybody knocked off and spent a winter. That's where Valley Forge comes from because the roads were so impassable with snow, it was almost impossible to fight. And that's one of the reasons why the war lasted so long. Now, finally, he was able to retire in 1783 to 1789. And uh, I mean, he was so famous in his day that he actually wound up getting so many visitors. And the way it worked at the time was that if somebody showed up at the door with a letter of introduction from someone the Washingtons knew, they, uh, with typical Virginia hospitality, they invited them in not only to dinner, but sometimes even to stay as well. And that caused quite a strain on uh, the ability. I mean, this house is only 21 rooms. And so it's not a huge mansion. I mean, 100 years later, millionaires would build homes big enough for Mount Vernon to fit inside in. So it was it was quite an effort trying to receive everyone and, and accommodate everyone. But uh, one of the things that some of the uh, people who were there, it says here, Washington received as many 677 guests in 1798 alone. And uh, some of them were his old commanders from the war, like General Nathaniel Green uh, said uh, that he said, Mount Vernon is one of the most pleasant places I ever saw. And Baron von Steuben, who trained our American army in actual European military and marching and tactics, he said he was delighted with the place and charmed with the reception he we met with. So it really did make quite uh, a hit with most guests. Now, of course, what kept all of this going, and this is uh, was slavery, and I mean Washington had uh, a very, very, very mixed record, both bad and good. And uh, in one article I read uh, said, after wending his way through the economic, political, moral quagmire of slavery and his will, his final and most symbolic message to the nation, George Washington presented a blueprint for ending the peculiar institution. Because uh, uh, you may remember when uh, Obama was president, he said he had uh, evolved on his position of gay marriage. To a certain extent, Washington had evolved on slavery. Not that uh, he freed all of his slaves. That will come in, in a minute. But uh, he, he questioned the institution, which is, a lot of his peers didn't. And uh, 
he felt it was a, a slavery was a divisive uh, issue for the nation, which certainly proved to be the case. And uh, so uh, one of the his better things was that he recognized uh, illegal uh, slave marriages. So if people declared themselves to be married, that was all right with them. And also he seemed to be very resistant from what I've read to actually splitting up families, even though it was in his economic interest to do so. But on the other hand, uh, one of his most egregious cases was when he was still president, uh, his uh, wife's lady's maid was going to be given as a wedding present to someone. And apparently her name was known to judge. She got along very well with Martha, but apparently she didn't think she would get along with her new mistress. So she actually escaped from Philadelphia and got herself to New Hampshire. And Washington wanted the federal marshal's office to capture her and bring her back, which being New England and being rather anti-slavery, they basically fiddled around and somehow never managed to do it. So she spent the rest of her life as a free woman. She's a very interesting case. But uh, in his will, getting back to his will, he, it shows you how complex this whole thing was at the time because, you know, we all learned in school that he freed his slaves on his death, but there were actually something like over 300 people in bondage on Mount Vernon, and his will freed 124 of them because these were the people he owned outright. The others belonged to Martha. And when she, uh, she was able to free some on her death, on his instruction, but others were actually inherited by the Custis heirs because George and Martha never had children of their own. When he was a young man, he had smallpox, which made him resistant to the disease, which ravaged the Continental Army. But he didn't catch it. But the bad part was that it made him sterile. So he had no children. They, he raised her children and their, grand, uh, their grandchildren. Now, this is, shows you how good this website is. They actually have a full page called The Legacy of Bondage. And it has a lot of details about how slaves uh, live, it actually has small biographies of some of them, and uh, it's definitely worth a look. All you have to do is Google Mount Vernon dot org, Mount Vernon, all one word, dot O-R-G, and uh, it is a magnificent website, one of the best I've ever seen. Now, uh, over the years, they have uh, been recreating buildings that were lost after Washington's death. And uh, this is uh, a typical reconstruction, what they felt based on their research of where a slave would live while Washington was alive. And uh, so that's, that's, that's what, if you wanted to see what they look like, that's, that's what they did. And of course, today they actually have interpreters, uh, employees of the estate who actually portray historical characters and explain how things were done for the farm, for the house. So it's uh, Mount Vernon is not a static uh, place. There's a lot of stuff going on, and that's one of the reasons why it's a great place to bring kids. And uh, starting in the 1980s, they actually have uh, a, a memorial and a very contemplative garden. You could go 
and sit there and view the memorial and everything. And uh, they, the estate has made as much of an effort as it could to recognize its less than stellar past and allow people to learn from it. Now, when Washington died, it was a whole new ball game because having no children of his own, it passed to his actual grandson. And the, the 19th century, after Martha's death in 1802, it just, you know, a whole uncertain future was before the estate because one of the problems with the Virginia at the time was that a lot of their wealth came from tobacco and uh, tobacco and when they started planting cotton is so bad on soil that unless you do very, very careful management, which a lot of people didn't do, the land just plays out and nothing grows. So it was good that the estate was getting more expensive but it was also generating less revenue. Okay, uh, so basically, in order to keep things going, uh, the Washington heirs, they sold off most of the, uh, the contents of the, the house, and there's very little in the house that was actually original to it, but there are some. One of them is actually a key the Marquis de Lafayette visited Washington after the Revolutionary War and presented him with the key to the Bastille when it was liberated in the French Revolution. And it actually hangs by the staircase in the main hall. But that was sold according to this 1846 article and it was sold for 75 cents, which is roughly about $15 today. And it was actually purchased by uh, Colonel Alexander Rind, who actually presented it back to the family. And that's why it's there today. And Senator Daniel Webster actually bought uh, Washington's memorial medals that he had gotten in this campaign for $500, which today would be about 20000 So there, there's not a lot there, but there's some, some things there. But what you will see there are the kinds of things that the Washingtons used. And uh, so it's, it's definitely worth seeing. And every other president's house has missing pieces. For instance, uh, uh, James Madison's home, Montpellier, when uh, Dolly Madison's son had ran up so much debt that she was forced to sell everything and move to Washington, D.C. And uh, so just a lot of things. They just, all these places do the best they can. And the thing I have to stress is that Mount Vernon was the very first president's home to even start to be preserved and restored. It was the template for every single founding father's and president's home after that. Now, of course, uh, according to the paper, this is uh, a, a, an article about someone's visit. And then you had to write to the family in advance saying you were coming and ask for permission. And they would send you back a letter saying you could come. And so they described this. And one of the things that surprised them, and it surprised me when I found it, was that uh, they actually uh, had restored slavery uh, to Mount Vernon. And uh, according to the article, the current owner was John Augustine Washington, who was like uh, Washington's great grandson. He was about 25 at the time. And uh, when the visitor from the North questioned uh, the presence of the slaves, and uh, he said that uh, uh, Augustine, John Augustine recognized that they had been free, some of them had been free, but in his view, said they would have been much better in a penitentiary. 
which sounds very harsh, except that under Virginia law, it was very hard being uh, black and free in that uh, environment. And I mean, everyone was out to get you back into slavery any which way they could. I mean, you had to carry your papers with you constantly to show that you really were free. And uh, if you remember the movie 12 Years a Slave, this man from the north, from New York, was duped and sold to a slaver. And he spent 12 years as a slave before he was able to get back to his family in New York State. So it was not it was not an easy time. In some ways, strangely enough, a slave had more legal protection than someone who was free. Now, this is another article from around the same time saying that uh, uh, according to this, that their resident historian, her name was Tom, Harris Thompson, that the real hope for the family was to be able to sell Valverna to the government. And uh, they approached the state of Virginia and the federal government and nobody really wanted to do it. And really actually nobody could at that time because there was, as she pointed out, there was no governmental agency to take over the management of the estate. And uh, there was no Department of, in of the Interior. That didn't start till 1849. There was no National Park Service. That didn't happen until 1916. And uh, John Augustine wanted $200,000 for the property. That was an immense sum at the time. And... Uh, it was, it was, you know, the fate of the house was literally hanging by a thread. And the house was getting really in desperate shape. If you notice, if you look very carefully, you see these columns? They're trying to hold the piazza the roof up before it collapses. And... Uh, as you can see, the house isn't painted. Everything's really a mess. And uh, you know, Washington was offered $300,000 to purchase the estate by speculators who want to carve up the land and develop it in various different ways. And uh, it, was a, it was a lot of money uh, that they were asking. And what he was going to do is uh, John Augusta was going to sell uh, 200 acres of the estate with the house and its outbuildings in one package. But as it turned out, neither the federal government or the state of Virginia wanted to cough up the money. And as we were getting closer and closer to uh, the Civil War, Nobody thought it was really worth spending their time and money on. Here we go to the rescue. Uh, Anne Pamela Cunningham, and this is a picture of her here. Her mother had seen Mount Vernon from a passing steamboat on the Potomac. And she wrote to her daughter saying, as uh, is describing how close to ruin and sale for speculation the estate was. And uh, she put a challenge to her daughter saying, if the men of the country won't save Mount Vernon, the women should. <laughs> and here's what happened. This is a letter that was published in every Southern newspaper and many, many Northern newspapers by Anne. She uh, wanted to uh, appeal to the women of the country to raise the 200000 that John Augustine wanted. And uh, she said that pilgrims of the shrine of true patriotism should find the forgotten and surrounded by blackening smoke and deafening machinery where money, money, only money ever enters the thought and gold, only gold 
moves the heart or moves the arm. And believe it or not, it took a, a few years, but they actually raised the money. And in 2024 dollars, they purchased the estate for 200000 So John Augusta was willing to take a $100,000 loss in order to sell the estate intact. And in our money, it would be over $7 million. So it was quite a sum for the time. And the Ladies Association, this is a very early picture, probably taken in the 1860s. They occupied the estate in 1860 after the purchase. And uh, they set about trying to immediately, I guess they had to start shoring up the house itself to make sure it wouldn't collapse as well as getting it cleaned. In fact, the earlier article in the 1840s, they remarked how many of the outbuildings were pretty much gone, either gone outright or uh, nearing collapse. And in the Civil War period, I mean, it could be a little tricky trying to visit Mount Vernon. It's only, it's less than 25 miles from Washington. So it's, it wasn't that you can get there by boat, you can get there by road. And uh, Alexandria is only seven miles away. And uh, this is a view from Harper's Weekly of Civil War visitors observing uh, Washington's tomb, a patriotic ceremony. But actually, both Confederate and Union visitors respected uh, the history of the place, and it, it was largely intact. Now, who didn't get there was President Lincoln. He wanted to go. He was traveling on a steamboat, and he asked for it to stop in 1862, but he was advised not to disembark the vessel. And according to John Dahlgren of the Washington Navy Yard, he said, I advised the president not to land and remained in the boat with him. And uh, because uh, there were a lot of theories, you know, conspiracy theories floating about, about somehow trying to kidnap the Lincolns and, uh, I mean, even John Wilkes Booth actually planned the kidnapping rather than actually assassinating him as he did. Now, in the post-Civil War, uh, things start to resume, uh, but uh, this Union private wrote a letter which his father submitted to the Brooklyn Times Union newspaper uh, telling his son was describing his visit, and uh, he was very jaundiced about his experience there. This is what he said, all seem bent on obtaining from the visitors all the money they can from the white matron to the lowest Negro on the place. He further described the, uh, uh, the matron's answer to a question as curtain pointless until the visitor offered 50 cents roughly about nine, over $9 today. And it would unleash a torrent of words, making you glad to escape her presence and generally would procuring an extra quarter in order to make your escape. But tourism uh, picked up and this is the 1880s view of visitors going about as you can see uh, from here, the, according to this print, the house looks quite a bit better than when we saw it earlier. And of course, in the 19th century, there was a lot of promotion of Mount Vernon. And one of the best ideas the ladies had was to use a media that was basically the television and the computer of the late 19th century. Stereopticon cards, where if you've never experienced them, there are two images on one stiff cardboard card that's slightly bent, and you put it in a viewer, and when you look at it, you find a 3D image 
of uh, the, the house or anything. And they were absolutely, people were fascinating. They produced hundreds of thousands of them. And Mount Vernon was an ideal candidate. And of course, uh, they invited or, you know, catered to distinguished visitors. And here's a picture of First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt in the 1930s visiting. And uh, she's standing on the piazza, as you can see, talking with other ladies. And uh, so that helped keep tourism going. And now they hit a real problem by mid 20th century during World War II. The pre war attendance of 750,000 visitors faltered because of gas rationing. Most Americans were only allowed three gallons of gas a week, which was issued to those with cars who were uh, non-essential travel. And it just didn't seem worth the effort to actually go. Now, what the Ladies Association did in this picture is that they allowed visitors into the grounds for free on Washington's birthday in 1942. And uh, so 4,000 people toured the estate and many more listened to a nationwide radio broadcast about George Washington and education and spiritual faith. And post-war, uh, they had also distinguished foreign visitors, and we'll touch on that again in a little bit. Uh, Crown Prince Ibn Saud of Saudi Arabia, he toured the estate, and this is him and his party in the hall, and this is generally where you see the key to the Bastille, but it wasn't there at the time because they often, things shift around in the house because as they keep researching Washington's time there, they sort of get a better idea of how uh, he and his family used the house. And you'll see an example of that in a minute. Now, this is uh, bringing more up to the present. Uh, you can actually see the National Park Service has a web page dedicated to Mount Vernon and the estates because it happens to be on the Potomac Heritage National Scenic Trail. However, that's about as far as the government goes and with the Mount Vernon, and we will see that shortly. Now, the Ladies Association has been the very, very first and always try to use the existing paperwork that was left. And uh, I mean, when they bought the house, they purchased all the plantation records and, you know, anything, all the correspondence that was left. And they were often uh, used. And this was a prime example because, uh, you know, most of the pictures you've seen and you can still see them on the, the internet generally show the house as painted stark white as you see up here but uh, lately by uh, going down to very uh, elemental paint chips from the 18th century they found that uh, the paint was mixed with crushed shells which sort of give it a more cream-like exterior. And that is actually historically more accurate. And this is some of the technology that they use. They actually scan everything and uh, to analyze uh, everything wherever they can find the components so that they can do a faithful restoration of a, a room's particular function. And this is an example of what I was telling you about, because uh, these are two pictures. This is a 19th century and a 21st century picture of the same room, uh, the West Parlor. And the way the Ladies Association saw it, they had a globe here by the door. They had these painted pictures here, chairs flanking the fireplace. 
and sort of like a small divine to, to sit on. So they imagined it to be a sitting room, whereas today it seems to be, from judging by the table with the candles, uh, it's definitely a gaming table for cards, dice, and so research has proven that that's more like how the Washingtons actually use this particular room. Now, they, as long as the house, they are restoring the gardens. And one of the things they rebuilt is the orangery, which Washington had built in order to preserve more southerly plants to protect them from the Virginia uh, winters. And a lot of the material, anything generated by the estate or written about the estate that the association can uh, uh, get is put in the Washington Library. And then that's where all the archives of not only George and Martha, but everything to do with Mount Vernon is there. And they've been digitizing a lot of things. So you can actually go on to the website and see quite a bit. So I would definitely uh, think, uh, uh, visit that because it's not only open to scholars, but it's also open to the public. And this is Washington's last restoration uh, expansion of house. It's called the New Room. And it was meant to be a reception, a small ballroom, a larger dining room for guests. And uh, uh, Washington actually had it put together three phases in the 1776 to 1779. He had the wall taken out and an extension built on the house, two-story wing. However, uh, it, it was just, there was nothing in it. It was like a barn. And uh, after the war, he converted the bare shell into an actual room in the current Adam style, which was fashionable in, in, in London at the time. And uh, finally, phase three in the 1790s, had the room had its most finished appearance as we see it today. And uh, along with the house, they've been rebuilding or restoring the outbuildings that help support the estate. And Washington was very enterprising. He Anything that he could do to keep the estate solvent, he did. And actually, one of the bad things economically about slavery, aside from the moral burden, is that it just didn't uh, it just wasn't economically feasible. And uh, so he was always looking for other income streams. And this is what he did. He had uh, a gristmill built and uh, a distillery, which were restored. And that helps pay to support the estate. You can actually buy. And that helps pay to support the estate. You can actually buy. Yeah, you can actually purchase. Right. Right. Huh? Question? Your internet's going in and out a little bit right now. It hasn't been until just, just this past minute. All right. Are we are we all right now? Can you hear me? Yes, thanks. Yep. Okay. Well, the estate distills its own rye whiskey, just like Washington did, and you can actually buy it. You, they have an extensive gift shop, which you can buy there online. These are all reproductions of China. Various things actually were used in the house. And in order to help generate money, they actually rent out the space for various functions. And in April of 2007, the movie National Treasure Book of Secrets actually filmed. This was not a set. This was the real Mount Vernon. And in the picture, Nicolas Cage 
has to crash the party from the river in order to get in to see a secret map inside the house. So it's a fun movie. I'm not very historically accurate, but it certainly <laughs> helped. It certainly helped the estate manage its restorations. And one of the things you could do is you can meet the family. You can actually pose with statues of uh, George and Martha with their grandchildren, which I think is really cute. And one of the things you can see is uh, the burial place for George and Martha. That's And you can't go inside, but you can stand at the gate. And... Uh, so that's one of the reasons, and in fact, actually, one of the main reasons why the house exists today is that so many people wanted to see the tomb. Uh, and that sort of helped generate more interest. And this is sort of a de rigueur presidential stop nowadays. And John uh, Adams was the very first uh, president to ever visit the house and uh, most American presidents since then and uh, on the website mountburden.org they actually have a timeline of all the presidential visits and in this particular one uh, the Bush uh, White House invites uh, President Macron and his uh, of France with his wife and uh, they're making a speech as you see, it was a very cold winter's day, and it was most probably Washington's birthday on February 22nd. And it's since its proximity to the White House, it just is a pretty easy stop most of the time. And it also, you know, helps generate more interest in the estate. And these are some of the things they've been doing with the money they raised. They're rebuilding the ice house. And they even actually have a whole page how the Washingtons kept cool. And of course, that big piazza you see on the front, that was one of the ways you could sit outside, get the breezes coming up from the Potomac, open the windows, get the breeze into the house. And uh, But ice was an important uh, component because in the wintertime, they would chop up the ice, wrap it up. Uh, you could either wrap it in coatings of like uh, rubber or sawdust and put it in an ice house and it would last you all summer. So that's what they did. They also had very small projects and they found several trash pits that were used in Washington's time by the staff. And uh, it's a, this is a piece of unglazed ceramic. It's called the Colano Ware Bowl. And it was most probably used in the kitchen. And old wells are a great source if you have years, decades even, of refuse uh, that you can dig through and analyze. And everything is cataloged. I mean, everything is cataloged. Now, uh, you can learn more uh, as you see from their website, there's a tab for planning your visit about the estate and the farms, about George Washington, about their preservation, their education. I mean, it is, I am so grateful. I love, I absolutely love this website. Now we're getting to the, you might ask, remember when I said that the National Park Service has only a glancing relationship with Mount Vernon, well, this is why, because the Mount Vernon Ladies Association, they still own the estate. They manage the house, the outbuildings, and the 500 acres left of Washington's original land holdings. And these are some of the current uh, members uh, who are the leadership of the association. And uh, what they have, is a statement saying Mount Vernon does not accept grants from federal, state, or local governments, and no tax dollars are expended to support its purposes. Primary sources of income are revenue from its retail and dining facilities, ticket sales, and generous donations from foundations, 
corporations and individuals. So you can become a member, you can give them a donation, all in and all to keep it. And uh, that is a little unusual because uh, like for instance, Jefferson's home, uh, that is owned outright by the government. Most of them actually are. So yeah, I have to give credit. They, they, they could have easily over the years sold it lock, stock and barrel to the federal government who would, would now would probably snap it up in a heartbeat. But uh, no, they, they they started with it and they're going to keep it. <laughs> now, looking into the future, this is a magnificent view, winter view of the estate from the Potomac. And I mean, this is something that Washington would have been absolutely delighted to see, but it wasn't possible. But as you see, it, there's enough land area around it to give it the appearance of how the Washington family actually lived there. And one of the great things about it is that on the opposite side of the Potomac, the government actually purchased the land on the other side. So when you're there, you will see the same view from the piazza that George and Martha and their guests and family were able to see. So we are ending this program here today. I am open to any uh, questions. So thank you very, very much for staying with me and I hope you enjoyed it.